the most outstanding prisoner you have ever met. Joseph was well-versed in unfair treatment, mistreatment, and being an innocent victim on the receiving end. First, he was treated unfairly by his family. His brothers despised him and planned to kill him, but instead sold him into slavery. Next, his circumstances were unexpectedly restricted. He was sold into slavery in a country where he didn't speak the language. He was a young boy with his entire life ahead of him one minute, and then he was completely at the mercy of, actually the property of, some stranger the next. After all of this, he was wrongfully charged. Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce Joseph after he gained the goodwill of his lord. When he didn't comply with her wishes, she lied and said, This slave attempted to assault me. He was wrongfully imprisoned and abandoned as a result of her lies. Joseph's Imprisonment That's where we come upon Joseph. He is in prison after being wrongfully accused, unfairly treated, and unexpectedly confined by circumstances. He is, in fact, imprisoned in a dungeon, according to Genesis verse 40, chapter 15. He's in a pit once more, this time at the bottom of an Egyptian pit. He's starting from the beginning. What was Joseph's age? No one can be certain. He was most likely in his late 20s. A more pressing question is, where was God? We can recognize God in the positive aspects of life, even in the questionable things. We can perceive Him. But where is God when things aren't going your way? When the dungeon experience occurs, where is God? Does His silence mean He's absent? We're not left to wonder. Genesis chapter 39, verse 21 says, The Lord was with Joseph. That's where God was. He was right there. He never left. He never left. He was with Joseph. Not only that, he did for Joseph what he had done before. He gave him favor in the eyes of others. But the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Genesis chapter 39, verses 21 through 23. Joseph flourished in the worst of circumstances. That freed him up to be used by God in the lives of at least two other men. You see, the Lord God remained first in Joseph's life. He was the center of his attention. The lens of God's will stood between Joseph and his circumstances, allowing him to see God in them, read God in them, and allow God to use him in them. When you have a dungeon experienced, the quickest and easiest reaction is to believe that you have been forgotten by God. How often do the heavens appear to be more like cold brass than God's loving abode? We scream, but nothing happens. Make no mistake, Joseph did not deserve to be imprisoned but he handled the situation admirably. That is the story's wonder. His vital and consistent relationship with his Lord was first and foremost in his life. And as a result, God used him in strategic and significant ways. Joseph's Cellmates. Genesis chapter 40, verses one through three. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard, into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. The cupbearer and baker for the king of Egypt then offended their lord, the king of Egypt, as a result of these events. Pharaoh was enraged with his two top officers, the chief cupbearer and chief baker. So he imprisoned them in the jail, the same spot where Joseph was imprisoned. A cupbearer was the person who tasted the king's wine and food before he ate or drank it. That way, if he was poisoned, so long, cupbearer, but long live Pharaoh. He would also not allow ill-prepared food to be served to the Pharaoh because he was in charge of the king's diet. This resulted in a very close relationship, one based on trust between the two men. The king of the land would frequently confide in the cupbearer. Nehemiah, as you may recall, was the cupbearer to the king of his day and had a close personal relationship with him. The cupbearer was the most trusted member of the court in many ways. If that trust was ever broken, 
there would be serious. Something similar must have occurred because Pharaoh's cupbearer, as well as the king's baker, were imprisoned. He was another person on whom the Pharaoh relied because whatever he prepared made its way into the Egyptian ruler's mouth. We are never told the specifics of what happened to cause this feud and punishment. We only know that they offended their lord and that he was furious with his two officials. Whatever it was, it enraged Pharaoh to the point of saying, get out of my sight, and had them both imprisoned. And because God's ways are profound, it happened to be the same jail where Joseph was imprisoned. Isn't it amazing how frequently God brings people alongside us who are going through or have gone through similar experiences? Isn't it amazing how God brings others who understand our pain alongside us when we are in pain? That is undeniably true in this case. Joseph and these two men may have ended up in prison for different reasons, but they ended up in the same place, suffering for similar tribulations. And Joseph was able to minister to them based on his own experience. But keep in mind that this was only possible because the Lord was first and foremost in Joseph's life. He became a useful instrument in God's mighty hand because he was free of bitterness. If there was any lingering resentment, hostility, or desire for vengeance, we see nothing of it in this story. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretations of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad today? Genesis chapter 40, verses 4 through 7. They were there on the whim of the Pharaoh and would not be there permanently. But Joseph had been accused by the wife of the chief executioner and didn't know if he'd ever see the light of day again. Despite his own predicament, he was moved by the plight of these two men. When your heart is in the right place, even if the bottom has fallen out of your life, it's amazing how sensitive you can be to someone else in need. They don't even have to say it. Instead of saying, you think you've got a lot to complain about, listen to my tale of woe. How come you're so sad today, fellas? Joseph asked. What's the matter? To ask this in a dungeon may seem obvious, but it demonstrates Joseph's ability to think beyond his own immediate cares and needs in order to minister mercy to others. One of the most beautiful aspects of having the right attitude is that it brings sunshine into your life every day. It is not necessary to have cloudless days in order to have sunny days. Then they said to him, We have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Genesis chapter 40 verse 8. They were worried about a dream they'd each had and could not interpret. Little did they know that they had the dreamer of all dreamers sitting in their midst. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. Genesis chapter 40, verse 8b. So Joseph said, Only God can interpret dreams, but tell me about yours. The first dream interpreted. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Genesis chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. The cupbearer said, There was this vine that grew up, and it had three branches. It budded and blossomed, and the clusters produced ripe grapes. I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. What in the world does all that mean? And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house." For indeed, I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. Genesis chapter 40, verses 12 through 15. Here was the beginning of Joseph's humanity. This is fantastic because it demonstrates that Joseph was a real person 
not some perfect saint. He was aware that an inmate could sometimes get out of prison by knowing the right person. Nobody knew Pharaoh better than the chief cupbearer. When the cupbearer returned to Pharaoh's presence and had his ear again, he should have said, Master, there's a man you should look kindly toward. Keep in mind when things go well with you, Joseph said. Can't blame him for that. Meanwhile, the baker had been listening in on the conversation and must have thought, maybe my dream is also good news. So he asked Joseph, the second dream interpreted. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Genesis chapter 40, verses 16 and 17. What does that mean? The baker inquired. Well, this is a little different, Joseph said. You must respect Joseph's honesty. He realized the dream meant the man was going to be killed. Who wants to be the one to deliver that message? He could have told the baker anything, even a lie, and the baker would not have known the difference. Or by the time he got there, it wouldn't have mattered. But Joseph was a man of integrity. He was there to represent God. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the bird shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Genesis chapter 40, verses 18 and 19. This means that in three days you will be executed. The news was grim, but Joseph told him the truth. Understand that having a contagious positive attitude toward God does not imply living an unrealistic life in which you constantly tell everyone nice, upbeat things, whether they are true or not. In effect, Joseph said, My friend, your days are numbered. That is exactly what occurred. The events involving both men unfolded exactly as Joseph predicted. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Genesis chapter 40, verses 20 and 22. Joseph's Disappointment When Joseph observed the cupbearer being released from prison, he must have thought to himself, This is my chance. This person has the ear of Pharaoh. He's going to get me out of here. Joseph must have assumed that, with God's guidance, he had given the accurate interpretation of the dreams when they were released in the time allotted. As a result, he awaited his chance to be liberated and set free. He must have expected the warden to walk in and say, You've been let free, Joseph. You've been remembered and you've been vindicated. Despite the fact that he had done no wrong, had merely told the truth, and had deliberately begged to be remembered, only silence prevailed. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Genesis chapter 40, verse 23. Two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows come up behind them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. These cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. Then the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up, but he fell asleep again and had a second dream. This time he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but they were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dreams, so he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told him his dreams, not one of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Today I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Some time ago, you were angry with the chief baker and me, and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the chief baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant. 
and everything happened just as he had predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. Talk about disappointment! Instead of being remembered and rewarded, he was forgotten for two more years. It's easy to miss that small detail buried in the midst of all these dream sequences and interpretations. However, Joseph remained buried in that dungeon for two years after the cupbearer had left. Take note of the emphasis. Two full years. Two years of monotony and misery. What was Joseph thinking about at the time? The natural reaction would be, Will I be on hold forever, Lord? I didn't deserve to be here in the first place. I also correctly interpreted the dreams and walked close to you month after month. I did what you asked of me. I faithfully served you. What I said was correct, and the man had forgotten about me. In fact, it appears that you have forgotten about me. No, there wasn't any of that. This remarkable man, victimized repeatedly, continued to wait, to trust, to hope, to rely on God. Joseph's situation then and ours today. The story of Joseph's mistreatment, disappointment, and abandonment resonates with all of us, yet he was outstanding. Closing Plea Listen to me, mistreated victims. More importantly, please listen to God's truth. He has a hundred different messages for you to hear during a hundred different dungeon adventures. He knows exactly the right message to send at exactly the right time, and all it takes to receive it is a sensitive, obedient, and trusting heart. Not one preoccupied with vengeance, bitterness, or hostility, but one filled with the words, Lord God, help me now, this very moment. Deliver me from my own shackles. Help me to see your hand beyond the darkness. Remold me while I'm being crushed. Help me to see you in this rejection and abandonment. Make that prayer. Turn your trial into faith as you look to God to tenderly use your affliction, dungeon, or abandonment for His purposes. I beg you, please do it today. I am confident that if Joseph could survive those years of mistreatment, loneliness, and loss, you can as well. I know your world isn't full of Egyptian dungeons, dreams that need to be interpreted. Your mistreatment comes in a completely unique package. But it hurts in whatever form it takes. You are devastated by the rejection. You did the right thing, but you were mistreated. Remember that God has not abandoned you in the midst of all of this. He hasn't forgotten about you. He understands the anguish caused by evil, which He mysteriously permits in order to bring you to a tender, sensitive walk with Him. Regardless of your current circumstances, God is good and Jesus Christ is real. My prayer is that He will do the same for you as He did for Joseph. May He grant you the strength to persevere. What do you think was going through Joseph's mind throughout all of this? Do you think he ever gave up hope? Did he believe he had been forgotten by God? At this point, his dreams were probably a distant memory, but God was working all things together for his good. He would use Joseph's imprisonment to shape his own life and the lives of the entire nation of Israel. Not only that, but God stayed with Joseph in prison. He gained favor with the chief jailer, and Joseph was given command of all the other prisoners. There are a lot of lessons we can learn from the Bible. To see one of the most astonishing ways God saved His people, click here.